Well, hello, and welcome again to the 2012fad.com. I will be your host for this evening, and my name is Charlie Bluehawk. Last night, we, we talked about the Mayan 2012 reboot, and what that might actually be. You know, what it might just simply be is a, a corporate uh, policy decision. Hey, the guy says in Mayan, I was only commissioned to do the calendar for 2012. Anything after 2012, the next cycle of time, that's somebody else's department. That's somebody else's problem, and it's not coming out of my budget. Could just be something really simple like that. It could also be, it could be maybe a restart of the program. If you and I are living inside of a three-dimensional holographic picture, a snapshot of the real universe, if you and I are actually being preserved against the future, our race destroyed, war, pestilence, something. And our scientists thought of a way of preserving the essence of who we are inside of a holographic image, a holographic picture, if you will. They took a snapshot of the universe, reduced you and I to particles of light, our soul, our consciousness, whatever you want to call it, and stuck us in a box, and then sent us on a long journey to some new world and this three-dimensional holographic box that we're in is simply to keep us alive, as it were, until we reach our new home. It would be like living in the same rerun of your favorite TV show year after year, decade after decade. It becomes so familiar you can actually talk along all the lines with your favorite characters. But since you and I are conscious and aware we want to change, we want to grow, we want to evolve, but we can't because we're trapped inside of a picture. And I actually tried an experiment with this uh, the other day. <clears throat> Excuse me. I actually, you know, we're expected to do things to get through the day. You have to eat something, you have to have some water, you got to have some sleep. You got to turn left to go to the store. You have to turn right to uh, go to the post office. I have to. You have to. You're expected to fill in some paperwork to get something done. I deliberately didn't do what I should do, and things progressed without me. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so if we are in a 3D holographic box. The program runs whether we do what we are supposed to do or not, because it's a rerun. You and I are forever trapped in the same rerun. We might have been in this rerun for a hundred years, a million years. And if it's only a 30-minute show, we've said the same lines tens of millions of times. And then when the show's over, program runs out, our memories are erased. The program, the rerun of your favorite TV show, starts again. And we say the same lines in the same way and get the same laughs. But after a while, since you and I are living in conscious beings, I hope, we, we, be, we begin to remember having said all of this before, done all of this before. Deja vu. I knew you were going to say that. Why? Because we've done all this before, over and over and over again. And I don't know about you, but I'm a little tired of it. So that's one possibility of the Mayan 2012 reboot. The other possibility is you and I are 19 years old. Our parents have spent a lot of money to get us the best education possible. So we go to university. It's a Friday afternoon. We lie down on a couch. We're plugged into a learning computer an interactive virtual reality where we go and we live an entire lifetime. You and I are studying um, North American history with a minor in American English. And we live an entire lifetime, 90 years, in a couple of hours. We're born, we live, we die. And during that time inside of this interactive virtual reality learning program, educational program, We've lived an entire lifetime. 
So maybe the 2012 reboot for us is, well, we have to be graded on how well we've done up until this point. Where this is just lesson one. Lesson two starts in 2013. We don't know what it is because the computer hasn't finished grading us yet and hasn't decided what the program's going to be in 2013. It's basing the future on our actions now. We're not judged by what's done to us. We're judged on how we react to what is done to us. That might be the 2012 reboot right there. Or this might actually be the real world, the real universe. And the Mayans didn't know what was coming after 2012 because that's the next cycle of time beginning. And if this is the real universe, you and I create it with our thoughts, with our actions, with our words. So there's actually no way of telling what's going to happen in the next cycle of time. Because the universe hasn't built it yet. Because you and I are still creating it. It's still waiting to be born. And so tonight I thought I'd, we would chat about the smell of poison. And this is real significant, actually, for me at the moment, because I have my regular news sources, which, frankly, I try to ignore, as I always do. But, um, you know, if I notice it, it must be really, really blatant. I mean, it must be so painfully obvious, because I honestly, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not... Uh, trying to put on a show for you, I'm honestly so darn slow that, you know, unless you hit me in the face with a shovel a few times, I just won't even know you're there. I mean, that's how dense I am. But for the love of God, if I can notice it, it must be amazingly obvious. So why don't you? But I'm listening to my regular news sources, none of which, of course, are mainstream. And I have found in the past that the best way to gauge whether a story is true or not is to get three or four or five different opinions on that subject from people who hate each other's guts, who, if they were in the same room, would rip each other's heads off. This is also, it's a good way of getting information, but it's also our greatest weakness. It's our master's greatest strength. Because no matter how much they hate each other, and they really do, they all tend to work together for a common goal. You and I, the 2% solution, because let's all be honest, 98% of us are, are cattle. Can't be reached, can't be helped, that's just the way it is. So at least 2%, the 2% solution, you and me. And yet, we don't seem to be able to accomplish anything either because of ego, or cowardice, or stupidity, or selfishness. You and I, we can't seem to work together to solve anything. And frankly, the solution to this problem of our masters is so very simple. You put con men in jail. You put thieves in prison. And that's all, of our, that's all our masters are. They're con men. In the bigger picture, they're parasites and they're soulless and they worship Satan. Forget all about that. Those are words we shouldn't use. The words we should use are con man, thief, racketeer, gangster, mobster. How hard is it to arrest the guy who robbed you? I don't know. But for some reason, the 2% solution, you and me, the supposedly the thinking part of the human condition. We're all ego and arrogance and weakness and fear. We're not going to win because we can't put the bad guy in jail. I smell poison. The smell of poison is just so obvious. I don't know why we just can't see it. For example, and this makes me sick to my stomach as I... Uh, I was reading various reports last night. Obama, the finger puppet, the moron from the mailroom. Obama, from my point of view, in the corporation known as Hate, Inc., he's the moron 
who works in the mailroom. Not because the mailroom is a bad place to work, but because he's stupid. He has no other purpose in life. Now, Obama is either a mind control slave or a lobotomized idiot. There's really no other way of, of looking at this guy. I was reviewing some reports last night, and it says that Obama has created this super Congress. It's also called the Council of Thirteen. The theory of this, in a world of morons and idiots, is that their job, this Council of Thirteen, Gee, the 13 ruling families of the Western world. Gee, I wonder where they got that idea. These 13 liars, this super congress, this council of 13, is supposed to figure out how to pay off the debt that you and I have to the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, the Federal Reserve Bank is a privately owned offshore corporation. It's not a part of the U.S. government. Do you know what the Federal Reserve Bank does? It has a printing press. It prints dollar bills. It's loaning us our own money. We owe this Kinko's, this printing house, $14 trillion for loaning us our own money. Somebody needs to explain to me why these guys are not in jail. Why they are not arrested, or at the very least, laughed out of the room. But as we've talked about before, our masters are not creative people. They're junior management at a very big corporation. And they're the lowest of the low. And then they have Obama working in the mailroom for them. Our masters are not creative. They simply keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Now, the super congress thing, well, you know, they did this in Russia around 1919, the uh, Russian Revolution, where they overthrew the Tsar and his family and brought in uh, a government of their own, supposedly a democracy at first. Well, they had this guy named Lenin <clears throat> who fronted this organization. You know who started and funded the Russian Revolution in 1919? Wall Street bankers. Why? Because this guy, Lenin, was working in Wall Street in New York at the time of the revolution. The New York bankers gave him money, shipped him back to Russia, and he became the head of something called the Politburo. So all of a sudden, this democratic revolution became the Communist Party, and Russia became the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So the Politburo was a small core of guys, Vladimir Lenin, uh, Trotsky, Stalin, you know any of these names from history? Probably not, because you're American. You have no knowledge of history. You might look them up. Politburo, P-O-L-I-T-B-U-R-E-A-U. And Lenin is L-E-N-I-N. -E look that up. You don't need me for this. So this democratic revolution against the aristocracy of Russia became communism. Communism fostered the Politburo, which is where a small group of men, all controlled by Wall Street bankers, seized control of Russia. Super Congress, the Council of Thirteen, the Politburo in Russia, same thing. Now, not long after that, the um, Wall Street bankers funded a little fellow by the name of Hitler, a nice little Austrian boy. He became the leader of the German people. He was actually elected. He actually liked the German people. He actually did things for them. He gave them the Volkswagen. He created highways. He gave them health care. Hitler's an interesting fellow. Here's a, here's a guy, a Rothschild. You might look up Rothschild for the fun of it. When Hitler came to power, and Hitler came to power because the German Congress building, the Reichstag, was blown up, set on fire, that rushed him into power, sort of like 9-11.
The first thing that Hitler did when he was elected to be chancellor, he created the Office of Homeland Security. Are you getting any of this? Hitler, in 1933, also created the Enabling Law, which he did in March 1933. So Germany, at the time, was democratic, but Hitler created the Enabling Law, which gave him the power to rule and govern on his own. We had 9-11. We had the Patriot Act. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Because it has the smell of poison to me. Our masters are not creative. They're morons. They're junior management. They're trying to impress senior management. How do you impress senior management? By doing exactly what senior management does. With the idea, I guess, senior management is either going to be impressed by you or disgusted because you can't think of anything yourself. Because none of these things last. Now, Obama has also gone to the next step in January 11, 2010, I'm told. He actually created something called the Council of Governors, which nobody talked about, nobody knew about. Basically, it gives Obama, the Pentagon, and Homeland Security, and hand-picked governors of specific states simply to tell them what to do. It takes away a state's sovereign rights, and it's a direct violation of posse comitatus, which is basically the law that we've had since Roman times that says no general may enter the gates of Rome at the head of his own army, which means you don't use the army as police. You don't put an army into a city unless you intend to invade and take control. Martial law. Well, I was reading these things last night, and have you ever, and I've done this a couple of times, have you ever reached for your cup of coffee and about to take a big swallow, and you realize it's not your cup of coffee? And you look down and you realize it's a cup of coffee that's stale, that's cold, and been sitting around for days? And then, even worse, you discover someone put their cigarette out in it, and you're about to take a big swallow makes you kind of sick to your stomach. You can't swallow it. You can't stomach it. I know I can't. I can't swallow it. I, can't, I couldn't stomach it. And even though after the last 40 years, I can't stomach it. I, the smell of poison of this is amazing to me because even though for the last 40 years I've been talking about this, I still can't believe it. I remember December 2000. I knew that was the last chance we had to take back our country peacefully, without bloodshed. Nobody listened. Nobody cared. Nobody was concerned. Nobody could believe it. Oh, that's just ridiculous. The rolling of the eyeballs, the signs. Oh, Charlie, come on now. So I went and talked to one of the few people I knew who, who I knew knew what I knew. And he just sort of shook his head at me and sort of smiled with a sad look on his face. He says, Charlie, you don't need me for this. You know the truth just as well as I do. You can see it just as clearly as I do. Give up. It's too late. And he left. It's the smell of poison. It's just, it all smells bad. I guess what this really gets down to is how is this possible? How is it possible that a small group of con men can actually convince us to do these amazingly stupid things? Steal our money, steal our jobs, steal our homes, steal everything we own in the world, and dump us out in the streets to die. Not to mention the fact that they kidnap our children, rape them, skin them while they're still alive, eat their flesh, and then kill them. And I can feel your mind shutting down even as I say that last statement. Maybe that's why. Because we are conditioned to certain words, certain concepts. Our minds shut down. 
say New World Order, your mind shuts down. Say conspiracy theory, your attention shuts down. Maybe that's why they're so desperate to physically poison our bodies. Because when you poison the human body, you're poisoning the mind. You're on drugs. You really are. So my question is, what would you do if you could actually smell the poison? What if you could smell the poison in the foods you bought from the grocery store and you're about to feed your family? What if you could smell the poisons in the food you just bought at McDonald's? Would you let your children eat it? What if you could smell the poison on the breath or the sweat of your lover, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your children, your mother, your father, and you could smell the poison coming out of their bodies because of the food you just fed them? Would you do anything? Would you do anything to make certain that they never ate poison again? Would you? I don't know. I mean, do you care? It's really your choice. It's really your decision. See, I lost my sense of smell when I was young. I was working in a fiberglass factory in a place called Huntington Beach, California, which is south of Los Angeles uh, along the coast. And fiberglass, you know, for your surfboard, your boat, whatever, fiberglass is actually very, very small, minute particles of a, a plastic plastic and is bound together with resin and you get that stuff into your mouth or your nose you lose your sense of smell you lose your sense of taste and I simply took it for granted that I would never be able to smell anything again or really taste anything again what I discovered years later is that by not eating poison not eating the food at the grocery store. Well, I'll, I'll take that back. What I discovered was, as I added organic food to my diet, and I was still eating the McDonald's, and I was still going to the, not too often to the main grocery store for my favorite things. But I discovered as I added organic food to my diet, and I added silver, what they call colloidal silver, to my diet, my body began to have a chance to recover, even though I still was eating the McDonald's and still poisoning it. I wasn't eating poison all the time. I was actually eating some organic food, which gave my body a chance to begin to heal itself. And as time progressed, I could begin to taste and smell what foods really tasted and smelled like. So I couldn't shop at the I couldn't actually even go into a regular grocery store anymore because the smell was so foul to me that just walking into the door of a regular market made me sick. So organic food gave my body a chance to eliminate enough poisons where I could actually have a sense of smell again and a sense of taste. And I think it's one of the many reasons I liked McDonald's food so much. McDonald's food was the only food that I could actually taste, that actually had any taste at all to me. Plus, it was inexpensive, it was easy to get, it was on my way to work, on my way home, there was nothing for lunch, it was convenient. But I could actually taste McDonald's foods. Organic foods I couldn't taste. It was just filler to me. It was just something to eat. So how is that possible? Natural food, real food, had no taste to me at all. No smell, nothing. But McDonald's food had a taste. I could very clearly taste and smell the food from McDonald's. And yet I couldn't smell anything else. I couldn't taste anything else. How is that possible? It's because McDonald's food gets their taste, their smell, from petroleum-based chemicals. McDonald's food is plastic. It gets its taste and its smell from petroleum-based chemicals. The same as the fiberglass that I breathed as a child. All oil products. Must have some connection between the oil product fiberglass and the oil product, the aromas and the tastes in McDonald's food. 
Oil knows oil. I have no idea. So now let's say you can smell what foods smell like, taste like. You can now smell what cigarettes smell like and taste like. You can smell and taste what Coca-Cola really tastes like. It's poison. The smell of poison. Would you eat it? Would you drink it? Would you stand by and let your family, your children, drink Coca-Cola if you knew what Coca-Cola really tasted like? If you could feel Coca-Cola burning a hole in your stomach, would you let your children drink it? To me, aspartame, for example, artificial sweeteners, even before I started working in fiberglass, even when I was a very, very small child, I could actually smell from a distance what aspartame smelled like, really. It smelled like battery acid, it's because when I was young, I worked on cars. So I was in, in, intimately familiar with all types of petroleum products, from oil to gasoline, plastic, because it was in my nose all the time because I was lying under the car covered in grease and little filings of metal. But aspartame from the very first day smelled like battery acid to me. I didn't understand it at the time. I just knew I wasn't going to touch it. But it's petroleum-based products. The drugs that the doctor tries to give you, all based on petroleum. They're all oil-based products. Did you know that the furniture, the walls, the lights, the desk, your computer, the carpet in your office, in a big office building, it's all made from oil. The smell of poison. Did you know that when plastic gets warm, your chair, your computer, the carpet, the drapes in your office, in your home, plastic made from oil releases a gas, a poison gas. It's called off-gassing. And plastic does this when it gets warm. Good way to try this out for yourself, go into your office in the industrial park where you work, go in on the weekend when the air conditioning is turned off, especially in the summer. After a very short period of time, you won't be able to breathe. Because you can't open the windows and there's no air circulation. It's because of the gas. You can't smell this gas. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless. Why? Because you're poisoned yourself. You can't smell the poison because your body is poisoned, but you won't be able to breathe. That same off-gassing effect happens during the week when you're in the office during a regular day. So you're being poisoned. You don't know it because the smell of poison you can't smell. Cigarettes are filled with artificial formaldehyde and artificial nicotine. And to me, the smell is a cross between burning sewage and hot asphalt, hot tar off the road. I want to vomit. The smell of poison. So I wonder if our masters, junior management, their, their desperate need to poison our bodies, which poisons our minds, we're on drugs. They don't want us to smell the poison because the smell of poison is everywhere. So they can rob us. We don't arrest them. They can lie to us. We don't ignore them. They can cheat us. And we just don't burst out laughing and walk away from them. Because in the bottom, the bottom line of this is they're just spoiled, rotten, nasty little children. And when Ben Bernanke talks, we should, we should honestly just laugh at him, pat him on the head, give him a couple of, couple of coins to go buy himself a candy bar and go outside and play. Are we going to do what he says? No, because it's stupid. But we do. We can't smell the poison. Nothing ever ends. Everything changes. So this isn't the end of the United States. It's not the end of us. 
It's just going to change. But wouldn't it be nice if it changed for something worth living for? The ancient Celts had a saying, a prayer, a hope, a blessing. For friends or for beloved strangers. And I'll share it with you. Because every day I understand it a little bit more. Because every day I become a little bit more of who I am, whoever that is. May you live as long as you wish. May you love as long as you live. For the 2012fad.com, this is Charlie Blue. The 2012 Fad is brought to you by Coffee and Blood, Love Letters Between the Dead, a series of five erotica horror novels about a fallen angel finding his way back to regain his own soul, and how the CIA war against the human race. Their black magic captures and traps him in the body of a mind-controlled slave designed to hunt down and to kill their god, their Satan.